Well, I this this friend of mine, Jim, he and I used to do some a little bit of uh, dog fighting in between wait for the the B-17s to come along. In fact, a couple of times I'd have to call and remind us what we were supposed to be doing. I remember I was such a good time being dog, dog fighting. I wanted to take you up and show you that I can handle the airplane. So we went up to about 5,000 feet and I did spins and rolls and anything else I could think of. I just rang that boy out good. And we, when we landed on the ground, he, he got out of the airplane kind of a little shaky. And I said, Jim, do you think that I can handle this airplane? I think I was the first girl to fly an F-16. F a beautiful F-16 was sitting out there, and he said, oh, Betty, would you like to fly an F-16? I said, sure I would. After all, if I could fly the pursuits of yesteryear, why couldn't I fly the pursuits of today? Oh, I tell you, I had a terrible ego. And they said, when would you like to fly the F-16? I said, tomorrow. I said, I'm not going to wait around. They'll change their mind. <laughs> I was the first woman to fly that. They had a doctor, I think he came in to see if I was of sound mind. <laughs> and he talked to me for a while and he says, there's nothing wrong with her. He said, she could, she could take that flight. I got in that airplane and I'm telling you, it was like I was, I was built in there. I just felt right at home. Of course, this is an F-16 of, of the day. But I flew the old warbirds of yesterday. So I was going to do a gentle turn. I said, a, I did a 6G turn, just like that. The guy got on the stick and he said, hey, take it easy. I don't have the brown bag in front. I said, honey, you can have mine because I don't need it. I'm Logan Ledman. I'm Samuel Temple. This month on 1855, we'll be telling the story of Elizabeth Betty Wallstrophus, a pilot from World War II who has received two Congressional Gold Medals for her contributions to the Women's Air Force Service Pilots and the Civil Air Patrol. I had the privilege of interviewing Liz last year for a 10-minute documentary I made about the WASP, which can be viewed on FCTV's Vimeo page. <coughs> Cheap. What's that? Uh, nothing. Something caught in my throat. Liz was born on November 15th, 1919. 19. How'd you know I climbed trees? I climbed trees. I climbed everything I got in my hands on. <laughs> I was always sitting in a tree and Dad would come out and call and call. And he'd stay under the tree and he kept calling. And then finally he'd say, okay, Elizabeth, now you can come down. He knew I was up there all the time, but he came to just call me. See what I do. <laughs> so I kept trying to hide from him. I was pretty skinny. I almost hid behind the limbs. <laughs> Gosh, she's fun. <laughs> Liz's love of escaping the ground led to some confusion among her classmates. I like to be what I say. I'd say I say hi, but when I said hi in the high school, they got a big kick out of it because, and I I didn't know why they were giggling. And I looked at the teacher and I said, "What did I say it was funny." And she said, well, your high and their high mean two different things. So after that, I'd always say altitude. <laughs> yeah. I went to school at the Macklin Conception School. It was a, it was a Catholic school. They had, they had one of those slides that just slide down. And through. That was for a fire, fire, fire drill. I just loved the fire drills. I'd go down that slide every often. Every as soon as I could go there, I'd, I'd go as often as I could. I loved to slide down that slide. <laughs> Beautiful family. I was. We had six children, and I was the fifth child in the, this family. Our daddy had been older when he married Mama, so God bless him, he died in 1940. But it was kind of sad because uh, Mama was left with taking care of six children. They said we were poor, but I didn't know we were poor. Thank God, Daddy had been a farmer, and he had a, he was a wealthy farmer. We had a beautiful garden in the backyard, and we had all the, the vegetables that you could possibly. We had two big apple trees back there, and we, we were well prepared with food, and we never went hungry. When we all got out of school, we went and got a job, and then we'd bring the, home, the money home to Mama, because this time Daddy had passed away. 
and uh, we didn't we had to have money to keep the home going. So that's what we would do. And so I I had a job, but I worked I worked at the local courthouse as a register of deeds for Al Harney. And but because I was a woman, I never got the same amount of money the fellows did as they were deputies. They'd get a hundred to hundred and twenty dollars a month, but I only got fifty dollars a month to start with. At that time, I didn't know what women were getting, so I yeah. didn't pay any attention to it. When I get the money, I'd bring it home for mother. You know, I never thought of it as discrimination. I thought, oh, that's the way it was, that women didn't get the money that men did. I didn't know why, because we did the work. Yeah. But it never entered my mind until later. Since the invention of the airplane in 1903, almost all pilots were male. Due to a mixture of that and the inaccessibility of floating among the clouds, Liz never even thought about flying. But that would soon change. I never even thought about flying. And one day, Frank Matichek came up, filed papers in the office, and he kept talking about flying. And I thought, gee, that sounds interesting. I could get above the the world and find out what's it like up there in the blue sky. And so when he saw that there was an interest, he said, well, we give rides to people who are interested in flying. Would you like to have a flight? Oh, would I ever have to like to have a flight? So one day after work, he brought me out to the local airport. There's a little strip there beside the big, big field. There's a strip there for our airport. And uh, he brought me out there, and uh, they said, well, you want to have a ride in an airplane? I said, sure. And so I got in this little plane and hooked myself up, and away we went. And you see, what they usually do is give somebody a ride, and then they go up about 3,000 feet into a spin, and then they look around, and the people say, down, down, down. Well, he went up that high and did a spin. He looked around at me, and I said, one more time. After 10 one more times, he didn't look around anymore. He landed, and he was sick. And he said, you know, whatever you do, you should start flying. You're the only one that's made me sick. I've made everybody else sick. So I knew I had to fly airplanes. They said, you know, you really should start flying. You really are. You're a born flyer. You don't get sick. And you know what? I never got sick in an airplane. I don't care what I was in. If it was an F-16 or a B-17 or whatever, I was never got sick. And I don't, I don't know why, but I never did. A sky club of 20 men were in charge of the Fairwell Municipal Airport, which is where we are right now. My great-grandfather Ralph Temple was one of those men. See, there's old pilots and there's young pilots, but there's only one Ralph Temple. And there really was. He did all kinds of acrobatics. He was great. I really enjoyed flying with him. He felt like I did about flight. Very generous with his time and with his, his airplane, with people. My sister Mary flew with him, my sister Cece flew with him, and the two, other two didn't care much. Well, Mary Kay was gone at that time, and me, we flew with your grandpa a lot. We had a, we had a club out there, your grandpa Ralph belonged to it, and it was called the Sky Club, and it had 18 fellas in the membership. So I'd go out to the airfield and hope that somebody needed somebody in the back seat to go for a ride because I'd be there. I did it because I just wanted to be out at the airport. And so one of the fellows went into the air court. I don't remember which one it was, but when they went in, he went in, I was approached by them and they said, now you can join our Sky Club. I said, oh, well, that's fine. What does it cost? It costs $100. Well, $100, I never saw $100 in my life. So I said, well, okay, I heard the banks own money. Now my transportation was a bicycle. I biked down to the bank and I said, Mr. Cowell, it was George Cowell at the bank, I would like to borrow $100 from your bank. And he said, Miss Wall, what are you going to do with $100? I said, I'm going to join the Sky Club. Oh, he said, women don't fly. I said, this one's going to. So. By golly, I, he co-signed my note, and he got me the hundred dollars. And by golly, and he took my bicycle as collateral, so I could only pay five bucks a month, ha! <laughs> because I had to give the rest of the money to mother. And so I paid my five bucks a month to him, and that's how I got my hundred dollars to join the Sky Club. 
Liz was 22 years old and had just started flying when the U.S. entered World War II. Well, when I heard, I was on a Sunday afternoon and I was home, and when I heard that, that Japan had bombed Hawaii, I was heartbroken because I knew by that time that we were going to be entering war. And I was thinking if I were a man, I'd be the first one in line. But I was only a woman. As the fighting heated up, America needed all available male pilots. Since flying had been invented less than 50 years earlier, there certainly wasn't a surplus of those available to the military. Anyone with any kind of air experience went to the war, leaving domestic airline services with no pilots. Jackie Cochran was a longtime lobbyist for women pilots, eventually succeeding in finding a place for women in the 1940s military. Two groups were formed the Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron, and the Women's Flying Training Detachment. They trained and started separately, but eventually merged into one group, the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, or WASP. These women were to perform such duties as transporting military planes to where they needed to be, training men going into the service, basically all non-combative operations for pilots at the time. Well, you see, what had happened, we went down to Sweetwater, Texas, and we got we got, we were in there for uh, six months. Our uniforms that we got there, they were all from the men that were there before. Thanks. Oh, sure, the male pilots, the, the ones that, that were good, there were, there were some very good male pilots and a lot of them did appreciate what we were doing. And once they found out that we could handle an airplane, we got along all right. And I showed them I could handle an airplane. Scared the hell out of them. <laughs> but you see, I just wanted to show them that regardless of what they did, we could, we could undo it and we could handle the airplane. When I finished my training, being that I was in what they call class 44, 44 one I was the first, we were the first class of 1944 to obtain our, our uh, beautiful wings. We were so proud to receive our wings. Yeah. And our wings, I don't have them on here. I'll show you our wings. They are, they are beautiful wings. And they have, they have a, a star in the center and uh, to signify womanhood. Instead of a shield, the men had shields. You see, when we went into the Air Force, we took the pledge the pledge of uh, honoring and, and serving our country and all that, and we, you know, raised the flag and everything like that. But we thought we were a part of the Air Force, but they never made us a part of the Air Force. And when we graduated, 10 of us were sent to Las Vegas Army Airfield. I want to tell you one time about when I was, when I was uh, in Vegas doing this, doing this job of flying for the government. I went over to this, place at Indian Springs and this great big, like a big hangar, and it was all open up to the north. I changed the prop picture of an AT-6, oh, that makes a beautiful roar. I turned around, everybody hit the deck. I thought that just show them that, you know, oh, I'm a good pilot, I know what I'm doing. So anyway, I went and I did what I was supposed to do for that mission, and when I was through, I have pulled up to the tank, uh, to the gas tank, to get some gas because I was a little low on fuel. And so when I got there, this man, young man came running across the field, and I could tell he was mad. Well, I had in my little uh, uniform there, I had a little little pocket. I had a lipstick, and I had a comb. So I took my head off and combed my hair out and put a little lipstick on and stood on the wing and then said, "Hi." He says, where's that pilot that flew that last mission? I knew he was mad. I said, am I your pilot? I don't think he said what he was going to say when he saw it was me. <laughs> he said, I'm going to report you. I said, what did I do wrong? He said, you scared the hell out of my boys. And I said, where are your boys going from here? Where they're going to combat and I want them to live, and I want them to, live to get there. And I said, you know what? I gave them a little scare. So they had it before they got there, so they could come home again. Well, anyway, we became friends later on, but he was very upset with me that day. As success in the war became more certain, men started coming back home again, and the need for the WASP program was diminished. It was then shut down. That was tough. Here I flew B-17s, 1,250 horsepower on each one of those four engines. I flew, oh, 
I, fl I flew the fighter aircraft, the only one they had on board, the uh, Era Cobra, and I just flew everything I got my hands on. And I was supposed to go back and fly a little Piper Cub. That was really tough. Treated as civilians, we were never. To, here I, you know, we gave the oath of the country when we when we went in, and we saluted. We were saluted and we saluted, and we thought we were, we were a part of the Air Force because it says Women's Air Force Service Pilots, and that's what we were. They said, "Girls, you did a good job. Now you can go home and lead a normal life." Excuse me, what's a normal life without an airplane? <laughs> That was really tough because we all love to fly and we didn't want to have to stop flying those airplanes, but that's what we had to do. So then, uh, you, so then even when you were back home, did you get any recognition? I went back home, no recognition. I'd wear my uniform on Veterans Day and they wonder what the heck I'm doing in the parade. Nobody paid any attention to me. I was a pilot from World War II, but they never believed me. They said women didn't fly, but I knew I did. And I did give a lot of programs in. Yeah, I did give a lot of programs. I told them my story. I said I was an unsung veteran. The WASP dealt with an anti-woman pilot mentality and deliberate sabotage during their training, but they flew on through their troubles. Our government did not want women flying their airplanes. They were very much against our flying, so they did everything they could to stop us. In fact, they even had a, a spy one time down there. They had gotten a girl to join, and she was a spy, and she was trying to find something wrong with our program. And she couldn't find anything wrong with the program. So her spying didn't do any good. And it was the general that took her down, to f and he wanted her to, to find out something wrong with our program. And they couldn't find anything wrong with it. So we... And, all, and also we had, eight, we had 38 of our women killed in the service, and we, I don't know, but I know there's in, some instances where there was sabotage. They would put sugar in our, our tanks, and the plane couldn't take off with the sugar. It, it, would, it would crash. And now I know some of them were, were some of them were, probably accidents, but some of them were sabotaged. We were very upset about that, and we went to Miss Cochran, and we thought that those people should really be found out and really be incarcerated for doing what they did to our women. But she told us we can't do anything. If we complain to the government, they're looking for anything that they can close our program down. And she said that's what they would do. They would close our program down. So we had to just ignore what was happening. When our women died, the, the general at the, at the, uh, the head of our, our, our uh, company there, he'd call up the parents and say, your daughter was killed in an airplane crash. If you send us, I don't remember the amount of money, you send us the money and we'll ship home the body. They'd put it in a pie box until the people, family would send the money so they could get the body home. We were not treated very well. We couldn't have a flag on the coffin of the girls that died and there was nothing to show that they had been with the Army Air Force. So it was a very sad situation. Yeah. But we kept it going because we knew we, had, we could fly airplanes and we had to show that we could do it. So we kept on flying. Mm -hmm. And I felt a little bit, I felt a little bad, bad about that. I felt that knowing that somebody killed our girls, I thought it should be reported. But when I realized what would have happened if we reported it, none of us said anything. We kept quiet. And that was pretty hard for us because we didn't like it at all that this was happening. Yeah. After the Civil Rights Movement and Title IX, the women pilots saw that if they spoke loud enough for recognition, they would be heard. I had been talking about the WASP for all these years. And uh, I, I guess we weren't really recognized, but uh, I kept talking. I've been to 30 states giving my programs and I speak to anybody who'll hear me. 
because I wanted them to know that we were pilots during World War II and we were women pilots of the United States Air Force. And you know what? We were called the Air Force and they were called the, they were the Air Corps and they didn't become Air Force until later and we were Air Force all the time. I had to mention that. Green Bay College, they had had me come over and give a program and they even had a play about our women pilots. I was the star. Oh, it was just wonderful. And they had used the, the university women, men and women, to put this program on. And it was a wonderful program. And they had, then they had the pictures and they had, oh my, they, they just treated me so well there. It was wonderful. I signed autographs that night till midnight. And I did it. I was very happy to do so. Went over there, and when I went there, we took a trip down to down to the to the uh, U museum at Oshkosh, and here she brought me in, and they have an AT6 named after me, Elizabeth Betty Walsh Trophis of Vingerfield, and that's named after me. Isn't that exciting? We flew in the back seat of an of a uh, P P51. Oh, was that fun! and he did a lot of maneuvers. <laughs> I love those maneuvers. But I always knew I could handle the airplane. That airplane couldn't be in any position that I couldn't pull out of it. Oh, it's terrible, I had a terrible ego. I knew nothing was ever gonna to happen to me. I'm still living. <laughs> in 2009, President Barack Obama signed legislation to give a Congressional Gold Medal to the veterans of the Women's Air Force Service Pilots. Liz has traveled to over 30 states giving her program, talking to schools and communities about what she did for the WASP. She says she never plans to stop. Because I was, I was proud of what I had done, and I wanted them to know that women could handle anything they had to handle in an airplane. To let the girls know, yes, of course, before that, they weren't allowed to fly, you know. And so I wanted them to know that the, the sky wasn't the limit, that they could go as far as they wanted to. The sky was never the limit. I wanted to go as high and as far as I could go. Logan and I would like to thank Liz Strophus for that beautiful interview. It's really an honor to speak with you, Liz. We'd like to thank Sam Dwyer for his original music that he gave to us and the Faribault Municipal Airport for allowing us to film here. Uh, we'll see you next month, everybody. Goodbye. See you then. Wait, we should say what we're doing next month. No, because we don't know. Okay, because we don't know. Never mind.